Chapter Ten of The Strange Adventures of Eric Blackburn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by The Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The Strange Adventures of Eric Blackburn by Harry Collingwood. Chapter Ten A Spider's Web. My next task was one which I felt I had already neglected too long, namely the provision of weapons to supplement our firearms and to save our ammunition for cases of extreme emergency. This I proposed to do by the manufacture of bows and arrows, if I could find material suitable for the purpose. So far as the arrows were concerned, I had already found perfect material for the shafts in the bundle of rushes I had cut in the shark bay swamp and which had by this time dried and hardened in the air until they had become all that i could wish for but i still required wood from which to make bows and i spent a whole day unsuccessfully searching the woods of eden for suitable trees but it did not follow that because there were no suitable trees on our own islet there were none on any of the other islands of the group Therefore, on a certain evening, I announced my intention of starting next morning upon a further voyage of exploration and discovery. In pursuance of this intention, immediately after breakfast on the following morning, I put two rifles in the boat, with an ample supply of cartridges, while we each carried a brace of revolvers in a belt strapped round our waists, in addition to which I took along with me a ship's cutlass to serve instead of an axe with which to cut any suitable boughs we might chance to find. For prospecting purposes I chose the western island of the group, not only because it was the largest and most densely wooded, but also because I seemed to remember vaguely having seen, when sailing past it on my way to and from the wreck, certain trees resembling yews, than which, of course, nothing could be better for my purpose. We got under way with a fine fair wind and headed for East Channel, entering which we ran close in under the precipitous cliffs that formed the northern coastline of the island inhabited by the natives. Thence we passed into North Island Channel with the mysterious North Island on our starboard hand, and as the boat buzzed merrily along, I kept the telescope focused upon the wide, flat plain that formed the southerly half of the island upon the off chance of catching another glimpse of some of its weird inhabitants but we saw nothing then rounding the southern extremity of north island we entered the northwest channel and with west island close aboard on our port hand hauled up to the northward keeping a sharp lookout for the trees of which i was in search it was about noon when i spotted a clump of those trees growing all together at no great distance from the shore and we at once headed for them and grounded the boat upon the beach looking well to our weapons to ensure that they were in working order billy and i each shouldered a rifle and made our way toward the clump of trees the grass was waist-high and very matted rendering the going rather difficult but the distance was a mere trifle and in about ten minutes we were at the trees i looked well at them and came to the conclusion that if they were not actually yews, they were of very similar character, sufficiently so, at least, to justify me in testing their quality. I accordingly climbed into one of them, and, with some care, selected about a dozen suitable branches, which I hacked off with my cutlass, and threw to the ground, where Billy retrieved them from the long grass. This done, we decided that the next thing in order was to pipe to lunch, which meal we discussed in comfort and at leisure aboard the boat. Luncheon over, we agreed that a little fruit would be acceptable, and leaving the boat, we set out to hunt for some. The vegetation on this eastern side of the island was not nearly so dense and impenetrable as we had found it on the west side, where we landed upon the occasion of our first boat excursion the undergrowth here being almost entirely absent. Consequently, apart from the trouble of forcing a passage through the long matted grass, we experienced little difficulty in penetrating the woods. 
but where the timber grew thickly it was, comparatively speaking, very dark, and the sudden transition from brilliant sunlight in the open spaces to the deep shadow of the thickly wooded parts was distinctly trying to our eyes. We went warily, halting at frequent intervals and listening for any sounds that might warn us of approaching danger, for we were now upon the biggest island of the group, and we knew not what dangerous forms of life might be lurking within the recesses of the forest, when, as we were looking about for fruit-bearing trees of some kind, quite suddenly the woodland silence was broken by a rapid succession of piercing cries that somehow suggested to us the idea of a cat in a state of acute terror and physical distress. "'Hark! What is that?' exclaimed Billy, laying his hand upon my arm. It sounds as though there was a cat somewhere quite near, in the grip of an enemy. Let's look for and rescue the poor thing if we can, Mr. Blackburn. A cat is just the thing needed to complete the home-like look of our bungalow. The poor thing is over there somewhere, and I'm sure it is in terrible distress. We hurried in the direction indicated by Billy's pointing hand, and a few seconds later saw, at a distance of a yard or two ahead of us, a commotion in the long grass, as though some creature or creatures buried in it were engaged in a violent struggle. The spot happened to be in deep shadow, and the thought came to me that, hidden in the thick masses of that tangled grass, some small animal might be fighting for its life, possibly in the embrace of a snake that, as likely as not, might be of a deadly venomous species. Therefore I put forth a restraining hand and said sharply to Billy, stay here and do not come until i call you i will go alone and see what all the trouble is about with a couple of strides i reached the scene of the commotion the cries meanwhile pealing out as piercingly as ever and as i stooped to investigate my cap came into contact with something that yielded slightly to the touch and was snatched off my head surprised and a little startled by the unexpectedness of the happening I straightened up to see my cap apparently suspended in mid-air. Still more surprised, I stretched forth my hand and seized the cap to replace it upon my head when I found that it strongly resisted my efforts, and looking closely to discover the reason, I saw that it had become entangled in a spider's web. Yes, a spider's web! but such a web as I venture to say very few men save myself have ever seen. It hung suspended from a branch quite ten feet above the ground. It was tightly strained between the trunks of two trees, at least eight feet apart, and it reached right down to the ground, where it was strongly interwoven with the long grass. But that web was not spun to catch flies. The meshes were from two to four inches wide, and although the thread was so fine as to be invisible in the subdued light, until closely looked for, it was enormously strong, so strong indeed that it required quite a powerful tug on my part to disengage my cap. My efforts to do so caused the web to vibrate strongly, and that, I suppose, irritated the owner, for while I was still tugging, the brute suddenly appeared from nowhere in particular, running swiftly over the web in the direction of the still-entangled cap. And that spider was in perfect keeping with the web that he had spun. There are home-staying people who, in their wonderful wisdom, will doubtless shake their heads and smile incredulously at what I am about to say. But possibly there may be among my more widely traveled readers, one or two, who will know from experience that I am not exaggerating, when I say that the body of the creature, of a deep ruby color, was as big as the head of an average-sized man. Its head was about the size of an orange. It had a pair of wicked-looking eyes that fairly blazed with fury, as catching sight of me it suddenly halted, glaring at me, emitting a low, angry hissing sound, and clashing its formidable jaws together in what looked like an access of perfectly demoniac ferocity. Struck motionless for the moment, in sheer amazement, I quickly recovered myself, and, believing that the thing was about to spring at my face and inflict a possibly fatal bite, 
I raised my cutlass, and with a slashing blow clove the creature through. Leaving the severed parts of the body still clinging tenaciously to the web, I next turned my attention to the screaming, frantically struggling creature at my feet. A single glance sufficed to show that it was obviously feline, about as big as a full-grown cat, and it had somehow become entangled in the bottom meshes of the web. It was fighting desperately, but ineffectually to free itself. Indeed, its struggles seemed to have but the more hopelessly involved it, for although it had torn a hole several feet long in the bottom of the web, it was still held fast by a dozen or more of the threads, while its body was completely enveloped in layer upon layer of the tough, tenaciously glutinous web. The unfortunate animal was evidently near to the point of exhaustion from its violent efforts to break loose, and when I bent over it the poor thing looked up at me and whined piteously, as though appealing for help. It was an appeal that I could by no means resist. Therefore, taking the creature in my hands, I tore it free by main force, parting thread after thread, until all were severed. Whether it was that the poor little beggar was too completely exhausted to struggle further, or whether it instinctively understood that I meant well by it, I cannot say, but the fact remains that from the moment it felt itself in my grasp, it ceased to struggle, and, when it was completely freed from the web, lay quite passively in my arms. I carried it to where Billy still stood awaiting my return, and showing it to him, said, "'Here is your cat, Billy, but you mustn't touch it yet, for it is in a filthy state, having been tangled up in the most amazing spider's web I ever saw.' Of course the boy immediately fired a whole broadside of questions at me, relative to my recent adventure. Also, he must needs be taken to see the web, and the defunct spider, after which, forgetting all about the fruit which we had started to seek, we re-entered the boat and set about upon our return to Eden, which we reached shortly before sunset. As we worked our way back through the winding channels, Billy beguiled the time by taking our newest acquisition upon his lap and endeavoring to free it from the clinging tangle of web in which it had enveloped itself, and so agreeable did the operation appear to be to the animal that it lay quite passive, permitting itself to be handled freely. And eventually, to Billy's great delight, it started to purr. For my own part, however, reflection caused me to question whether I had been wise in introducing this new member to our family circle. Had it been a dog, I should have had no doubts. A dog would have been a delightful companion for both of us. But this creature, what was it? As I have already said, it was about the size of a full-grown cat, and it undoubtedly belonged to the cat tribe. But despite its size, I judged it to be a mere kitten, and quite a young one at that. Its legs were much thicker and more muscular, and its fur was shorter and not so fine as that of the domestic cat. And although I had seen a good many domestic cats, I had never seen one marked like this creature, a rich, ruddy brown on the head, shoulders and forequarters, shading off to a light tawny color at the hindquarters and the tail, with just a suggestion of darker spots here and there, white on the throat, breast, belly, and the inside of the legs. It occurred to me that if my suspicions were correct, we might eventually find that we had introduced a decidedly awkward member into our domestic circle. But, meanwhile, I kept my suspicions to myself. Billy displayed the utmost interest in his new pet. Apparently he was unable, for the moment, to think of anything else. He was particularly anxious that the little beast should settle down in the house and become thoroughly domesticated, and with that object in view he at once proceeded to liberally smear its forepaws with part of our slender remaining stock of butter, having heard that cats so treated never deserted the house in which they had received such hospitality. Next he set to work to make a kennel out of odds and ends of material left over from the construction of our house. As for me, I considered that I was far more usefully employed in stripping the bark from the branches which I had gathered and converting them into bows. 
our respective enterprises progressed as satisfactorily as could be desired. Billy's protégé, which in a moment of inspiration he had given the highly original name of Kit, fed to repletion upon broth and fish, was apparently quite content to bask in the sun all day on the floor of the veranda, to be petted and played with by us when we could spare the time, and to take up his quarters at night in Billy's kennel, upon a luxurious bed of sweet-scented hay, while the bows, upon which I expended some pains, promised to be everything that I could desire. Billy and I made another voyage to the swamp in North Island, and collected reeds enough to make some hundreds of arrows, which we headed with hard, sharp thorns, embedded in about three inches of clay, at the head, to impart steadiness of flight to the missile, an arrangement which I found to answer admirably. Then, when our bows were completed, we set up a target in front of the house and practiced assiduously until, within a fortnight, we became sufficiently expert to hit a six-inch bull's-eye at two hundred yards every time. Having attained to this degree of skill, we could get as many birds as we needed for food, without the further expenditure of any ammunition. We accordingly hoarded the remainder of our powder and shot against the possible moment when we should be in dire need of it. Striving for perfection, I made twelve bows before I was quite satisfied with the result of my efforts, thus allowing one bow for each of us and a second as a standby, I had eight bows for which I had no particular use. They did not quite come up to my standard, yet I did not care to destroy them. After some consideration, therefore, I decided that they might be used as a medium for the establishment of friendly relations between ourselves and our neighbors, the natives on Cliff Island. Accordingly, on a certain day, placing the superfluous bows and a number of arrows in the boat, and taking our rifles and revolvers with us, Billy and I started to pay our visit. Heading south, a run of five miles brought us, in the course of an hour, to the western extremity of Cliff Island, rounding which we presently saw that the natives appeared to be all at work in their fields of maize and sugar, or tending their fruit trees. The sight of our sails gliding along within a short distance of the beach caused them to drop whatever work they might be engaged upon, to watch our progress, although the boat must by that time have become quite a familiar object to them, so often had we passed the island on our way to and from the wreck. Arrived at the spot where we had encountered the apes, I hauled the boat to the wind, ran her in upon the beach, and stepped ashore. This was the first time that I had landed upon the island since that memorable occasion, and consequently I was not surprised to observe that my action created something of a commotion among the inhabitants. The alarm trumpets were sounded, and there was again a stampede on the part of the women and children toward the curious caves in the cliff face, while the men came running together and rallying round an individual who appeared to be their leader or chief. Meanwhile I walked slowly up the narrow beach to the level ground beyond, and there stood with both hands upraised in token of amity. The man whom I assumed to be the chief stood intently regarding me for several minutes, as though endeavoring to gather from my actions what my motive for landing on the island might be, whereupon I beckoned, and then again raised my hands above my head. By way of response the chief raised his hands for a moment, and then proceeded to discuss, as I surmised, the situation with certain others who were probably minor chiefs. Finally, after I had several times repeated my beckonings, about a dozen of them, including the man whom I supposed to be the chief, came slowly toward me with their hands raised. Their approach was marked by a very considerable amount of hesitation, halts being frequent, and progress resumed only in response to vigorous beckonings on my part, so that fully twenty minutes were consumed in traversing the distance of some five hundred yards that originally separated us. But at length the party arrived within a dozen yards of me, and there finally halted. The moment had evidently arrived for me to declare my intentions. I therefore drew from my pocket a necklace of big turquoise blue beads that formed part of the truck provided by the late skipper Stenson, 
for purposes of trade, and, holding it aloft, advanced with a friendly smile towards the chief, who seemed more than half inclined to turn tail and run. As I purposely moved very slowly and deliberately, however, he stood his ground, and when I halted before him and placed the necklace round my own neck, a low murmur of admiration escaped the party. Then, removing the beads from my own neck, I stepped slowly forward again and lightly dropped them round the neck of the chief, who, I thought, seemed to find some difficulty in deciding whether he was the more frightened or delighted. But I continued smiling upon him in friendly fashion, and offered my right hand, in token of amity, a sign which he seemed to understand, for after a moment of hesitation he placed his hand in mine and gave a friendly squeeze, which I instantly returned. I now turned toward the boat, and, saying, "'Come with me, I have something to show you,' beckoned the party to follow me. Of course they did not understand my words, but they must have correctly interpreted the tones of my voice, for they followed me without hesitation, halting at the top of the bank, however, to take a good look at the boat, and exchange excited remarks concerning her, as I easily conjectured from their animated gestures. Meanwhile, advancing to the boat, I took from Billy a small wooden target that I had prepared, together with a bow and sheaf of arrows. The target I fixed up on the beach, and stationing myself at about a hundred yards from it, directed the attention of my little audience, first to the bow, then to an arrow, which I drew from the quiver, and finally to the target. Then, fitting the arrow to the string, I drew the bow to its full extent, and the next moment the arrow was quivering in the bull's-eye, to the amazement and audible admiration of my new friends. This feat I performed a second and a third time, and then led the party to the target, that they might see for themselves how firmly were the arrows embedded in it, and this evidently provoked in them further admiration, for they at once plunged into an animated discussion of the matter, some at least of them already appreciating the value of the bow as a lethal weapon, for one of the party, admirably mimicking the action of an ape coming up the beach, then drew an imaginary bow, and instantly clapping his hand over his heart, fell back in an imitation of the death agony. I patted him approvingly on the shoulder, nodded, and said, Yes, that is the idea, old chap. That is precisely what I want you fellows to understand. And again they seemed to comprehend me, for they all nodded vigorously. Then, wrenching the arrows from the target, I conducted the party back to the hundred-yard mark, and placing the bow and an arrow in the hands of the chief, signed to him to try his hand. Of course he made a terrible bungle of it to start with. First he failed to put enough strength into the pool, and the arrow flew only a few yards. By dint of patient coaching on my part, however, he gradually improved, and when, after practicing diligently for about an hour, he succeeded in sending an arrow as far as the target, although several yards wide, his delight and pride knew no bounds. I then showed him that it was possible to hit the target at double the distance, after which I took him to the boat and presented to him the remaining seven bows with their sheaves of arrows, which filled the simple fellow's cup of joy to the brim. He insisted on conducting Billy and me through the plantations of maize and sugar-cane, directed our attention to the orchards of fruit-trees, and finally led us to the cliffs, which I now saw were honeycombed with rock dwellings, and introduced us to his own particular mansion, which was a cave of some twelve feet wide by twenty feet deep, very stuffy and malodorous. Here we were entertained to a luncheon of boiled green maize cobs and several varieties of delicious fruits. His household consisted of an elderly woman, whom I conjectured to be his mother, two young men, who I understood were his sons, and five girls who might be either his wives or his daughters. When at length we were able to effect our escape from his rather pressing hospitality and return to the boat, I found that during our absence somebody, presumably my recent host, had sent down several baskets containing green heads of Indian corn, sugar-cane, and fruit, which we took back with us to Eden.' 
I, for my part, feeling well satisfied with the result of my visit. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Strange Adventures of Eric Blackburn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurney, Illinois. The Strange Adventures of Eric Blackburn by Harry Collingwood. Chapter 11 A Raid by the Apes. Having thus successfully established friendly relations with the natives, I determined to maintain them, and, with this object, made frequent calls upon the chief, who was most anxious to display the increasing skill of himself and his subordinates in the use of the bow. And indeed the progress made was exceedingly creditable, and quite sufficient to enable them to put up a good defense against the apes, which, I with some difficulty gathered, were prone to swim across the channel from time to time for the purpose of plundering the natives fields and orchards but if i understood my new friends aright these raids though not perhaps very frequent were occasionally of a far more formidable and disastrous character than i had thus far imagined not infrequently resulting in a quite serious loss of life on the part of those natives who were courageous enough to defend their possessions i accordingly decided to make and present to the plucky blacks twelve more bows with a sufficient supply of arrows to enable them to resist successfully the incursions of their formidable enemies the work of procuring the materials necessary for the manufacture of those weapons and the making of them together with the performance of sundry odd jobs in the garden kept me busy for nearly a month during which I was afforded ample opportunity to note the progress which Billy was making in the domestication of his cat. The beast was growing fast, and it was also developing certain markings which tended to confirm my original suspicion that it was some species of leopard or panther, a circumstance that not only occasioned me considerable uneasiness, but also led me to impart my fears to Billy and even to hint tentatively at the advisability of shooting the creature before the full development of its natural proclivities should render it actually dangerous but billy indignantly scouted the suggestion that his pet could possibly develop dangerous tendencies directing my attention to the affection which it displayed for both of us and i was compelled to admit that so far his contention was sound for the beast followed us about like a dog it could scarcely endure to be separated from either of us for any great length of time and it seemed never so happy as when lying at full length on the floor of the veranda before my chair with my feet lightly resting upon its body as upon a footstool and upon the now comparatively rare occasions when we took a trip in the boat kit was invariably to be found on the beach waiting and watching for our return and it was amusing to observe the delighted gambols in which he indulged as we stepped ashore the new bows and arrows being at length ready billy and i started for cliff island on a certain morning for the purpose of presenting the weapons to their prospective owners upon our arrival we were received by the natives with their accustomed cordiality and i at once handed over our gift to Bowata, the chief who was profuse in his expressions of gratitude I had by this time acquired a sufficient grasp of their very simple language to enable me to make a pretty shrewd guess at their meaning when they spoke to me, and also to make myself fairly well understood by them. And I gathered from Bawata that the gift was singularly opportune, inasmuch as that the apes had, of late, for some inexplicable reason, been unusually pertinacious in their raids upon the island, but that, thanks to my original gift, their attacks had been successfully withstood without loss of life on the part of the natives the invading apes having all been slain before it was possible for them to effect a landing the little fellow was immensely proud of those achievements as indeed he might well be considering that before the bow and arrow era every raid by the apes had resulted in the death of one or two natives and the more or less serious maiming of others and so proud was he of the skill which he and his people had developed 
that he must needs set up a target there and then that i might witness a display of that skill it now became apparent that Bawata was by no means devoid of shrewdness for not only had he personally practiced assiduously at the target but he had insisted that the petty chiefs who had been entrusted with bows should do the same and not content with that he had chosen some two dozen other men all of whom he had personally trained so that when i turned up with my gift he had already about thirty men every one of them a quite fairly expert bowman i could not forbear a smile at this intelligence imparted with the most perfect naivete for it almost appeared as though the man had divined my intention to make this second gift and now occurred a rather remarkable coincidence for while the display of native skill was in full swing the trumpets were sounded giving warning of another approaching raid the apes it appeared were heading for a point about half a mile to the westward of the spot where we were assembled and toward that spot the archers twenty in number including those who had been entrusted with the new bows set off at top speed followed by their unarmed comrades who merely delayed long enough to collect such blocks of coral and rock of suitable size as happened to be in their way as for me i announced my intention to attack the brutes from the boat if i should be in time to intercept them but bawata delayed his departure long enough to beg me to allow him and his men to deal unaided with the enemy as every victory gained by his people increased their confidence in themselves but he added if any of the apes should escape and attempt to swim back to their own island i should be rendering good service by destroying them on the way the sound common sense of both these contentions i instantly recognized keeping well off shore that we might be safely out of range of stray arrows billy and i arrived in the boat off the scene of the impending struggle while the leading ape was still a good three hundred yards from the beach and i was glad to see that the blacks were keeping cool and withholding their fire instead of wasting their arrows by discharging them prematurely the apes were swimming easily and keeping so well together that it was only with difficulty i was able to count them billy and i were agreed that they totaled sixteen which if i had understood bowata aright was far and away the most formidable number that had ever been encountered and i looked to our rifles and edged the boat in a little nearer the shore to be ready for possible eventualities then as the first arrow was discharged i brought the boat to the wind and hove her to the first shot was a miss but the second shot scored for i saw the leading ape shake his head angrily and go through the motion of plucking an arrow from his neck he swam a few yards farther however then he suddenly flung up his arms and rolled over in the water, motionless. I was glad to see that the natives had assimilated the advice I had endeavored, somewhat laboriously, to impart to them, to shoot singly at a selected mark, thus economizing arrows and promoting good shooting. They were adopting those tactics now, and the soundness of them was demonstrated by the fact that no less than five of the apes were put oars de combat before the feet of any of them touched bottom and they started to wade ashore then indeed as some half dozen of the huge creatures upreared themselves simultaneously revealing the whole of their bodies above the hips the blacks betrayed signs of panic a whole flight of arrows greeting the brutes but if that indiscriminate discharge was indeed the result of panic it was nevertheless thoroughly effective for every one of the monsters went down either dead or too desperately wounded to be capable of further effort the fate of their comrades however seemed in no wise to dismay or act as a deterrent to the survivors who five in number pressed resolutely on and finding bottom rose in quick succession to their feet and proceeded to scramble ashore actually passing between the bodies of their dead and dying companions and noticing them only to thrust them roughly aside in their eagerness to get to grips with their enemies but the latter were quite ready for them the success of bawata and his fellow archers thus far had inspired them with such confidence in themselves and their weapons that i believe not a man of them would have turned tail so long as a single arrow remained to them and as the surviving apes advanced they were met by such a withering flight of arrows that not one of them lived actually to emerge from the water 
and then with yells of triumph the victors rushed into the water and gave the coup de gras to such of the apes as betrayed any signs of lingering life let draw the foresheet billy said i we must go ashore and congratulate our friends upon their victory as the boat grounded on the beach i saw that several of the natives were still in the water busily engaged in retrieving arrows from the bodies of their victims but i had a shrewd suspicion that many of the arrows shot had been hopelessly lost and the suspicion suggested an idea upon which i acted later on but for the moment my attention was fully occupied by bawata and his people who crowded round us all talking at once some of them excitedly relating particular incidents of the adventure while others were striving to express their gratitude to me for putting into their hands the means to defend themselves successfully against the most formidable raid that had ever been attempted by the apes on our way back to eden i gave some consideration to the idea referred to above it was this long as we had been on the group without sighting so much as the most distant glimpse of a sail the hope was ever present that the day would eventually dawn when we should be rescued from our imprisonment mild and even agreeable as it was in some respects and when that day should arrive what would happen to bowata and his people who would continue to supply them with weapons of defence against their ferocious enemies it was obvious that from the moment of our departure from the group they would be left entirely to their own resources and to me it seemed that it would be only humane if not my actual duty to supply the means whereby it might be possible for them to replenish for themselves their supply of bows and arrows now how was this to be done i could see nothing for it but to provide them with something in the nature of a boat wherein to navigate the channels then to show bowata where the wood for the bows and the shafts for the arrows could be obtained and finally teach him and his people how to make bows and arrows for themselves i fully realized that to present the savages with a boat might be a proceeding not altogether devoid of danger for savages even such apparently harmless savages as our neighbors were apt to develop treacherous tendencies and once provided with a boat it would be difficult to prevent them visiting our own particular island of eden when if any of our possessions should chance to excite their cupidity who could say what might happen there was of course a way whereby this danger might be reduced to a minimum and that was by so reducing the dimensions of the boat that she should be incapable of carrying more than two men at a time and this i determined to do as to material there was plenty of such as i required to be obtained from the wreck for i meant the boat to be of the simplest construction being in fact nothing more than a miniature flat-bottomed thames punt to be propelled by a pair of paddles having settled this matter to my satisfaction i explained my intention to billy that evening as we sat together under the veranda discussing the events of the day by the light of the glorious full moon with kit sprawling as usual at my feet my intention was to start next day with billy for a trip to the wreck where i proposed to remain until i had constructed the punt which i believed could be done in something less than a week starting immediately after breakfast taking with us the carpenter's tool chest an ample supply of fruit and food and of course kit who could not possibly be permitted to roam eden at large and be deprived of our company for a whole week the voyage was accomplished without incident and we arrived at the wreck early in the afternoon we found the old craft in every respect just as we had left her excepting that her cabins having been securely closed during our absence were distinctly stuffy this was soon remedied however by throwing back the companion slide and opening the skylight in all the scuttles after which we filled in the remainder of the afternoon in making up the beds in the staterooms and preparing generally for our week's sojourn when all was done an hour or two of daylight still remained which i utilized by preparing a sketch of my proposed punt she was to be five feet long on her bottom with a rising floor two feet long at each end making her nine feet long overall with a beam of four feet and sufficient freeboard to enable her to carry two men safely in the tranquil waters of the inner channels 
being flat-bottomed flat-sided and square-ended she was an easy model to build there were no planks to be bent and as the wreck afforded abundant material and as we did not aim at such refinement of finish as was included in a coat of paint we completed our task during the afternoon of the fifth day even to putting her over the side into the water to take up leaving the wreck immediately after breakfast the next morning with the punt in tow we arrived at our anchorage in eden cove about half an hour before sunset almost the whole of the passage being a beat to windward while the towage of the punt further retarded our progress we however found everything just as we had left it and although i think we enjoyed the little change involved in living on the wreck we were glad to find ourselves once more at home particularly kit whose rambles had been restricted to the deck of the ship and who displayed his delight at returning to the wider spaces of eden by starting off at full gallop the moment his pads touched the sand rushing out of sight and appearing no more until we reached the house where we discovered the beggar squatted on the top steps of the veranda awaiting our arrival on the following morning after breakfast billy and i got the boat under way and with the punt in tow sailed for cliff island running the boat in on the beach we were quickly joined by bowata who informed us that four days earlier the apes to the number of nine had attempted another raid which he proudly added had been successfully repulsed but at the expense of many lost arrows and he hinted pretty broadly that a further gift of those very useful missiles would be highly appreciated whereupon i informed him that i intended to do even better than continue to furnish him and his people with bows and arrows i was going to present them with means whereby they might procure the materials wherewith to make for themselves as many of those weapons as they pleased and therewith i led him down to the beach and directed his attention to the punt bowata looked at the craft and grunted his approval of her but it was evident that he had not the remotest notion of how she was to be the means of providing him with bows and arrows so casting off her painter billy and i stepped into her and paddling along close to the beach showed the savage in a very practical manner how to handle her next landing billy and taking bowata into the punt with me i handed him a paddle and first directing his attention to the manner in which i manipulated my own invited him to try his hand he proved an apt pupil and within the hour was able to maneuver the punt single-handed then beaching the punt and securing her to a stake firmly driven into the beach i invited bowata and his son to enter the sailing boat informing them that having given them the means to navigate the channels i now proposed to show them where to obtain the wherewithal from which to make as many bows and arrows as they desired the pair entered the boat with a distinct suggestion of trepidation they could understand the punt apparently but they had evidently not yet grasped the fact that it was the wind that endowed the boat with mobility and they seemed to regard her with distrust as a magical craft that might as likely as not fly away with them never to return they were under the impression it presently appeared that we intended to turn them adrift to shift for themselves as best they could but when i explained that billy and i intended to go with them their fears vanished and they seated themselves contentedly enough in the bottom of the boat in the places which i indicated it was perfectly clear that not only they but also their fellow savages regarded the expedition upon which we were embarking as a quite notable adventure for they assembled in force to witness our departure admiration and apprehension in about equal proportions being the dominant expressions upon the countenances of those we left behind us as the boat glided smoothly and rapidly away from the shore i took our guests first of all to west island upon which grew the trees from which i had obtained the wood found to be suitable for the making of bows and having directed bowata's attention to the characteristic peculiarities of the trees as distinguishing them from others i shinned aloft into one of them carrying with me a small hatchet that had come from the wreck and proceeded to lop off about a dozen suitable branches which with an ample supply of thorns to form arrowheads were duly placed aboard the boat then shoving off again we proceeded by way of the northwest channel round to shark bay in north island where 
running the boat into the swamp we cut a goodly stock of reeds from which to make shafts for the arrows these two tasks including the time occupied in sailing from place to place and returning occupied the entire day so that it was already dusk when having landed boata and his son and our cargo of branches and reeds we arrived back at our own island of eden the next day billy and i again sailed for cliff island where with an old sheath knife as a tool i showed boata how to make bows and arrows at the same time presenting him with the hatchet the knife and a quantity of cord from which to make bowstrings we spent three days with the natives supervising their work of making bows and arrows and by the time that they had used up all the material with which i had supplied them they had attained to a degree of proficiency that i felt would justify me in leaving them henceforth to their own devices end of chapter eleven recording by warren cotty gurney illinois chapter twelve of the strange adventures of eric blackburn this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by warren cotty gurney illinois the strange adventures of eric blackburn by harry collingwood chapter twelve islands of fire we had by this time been on the group eight months and although with brief intervals spent in visits to the wreck a sharp lookout for the appearance of a sail in the offing had been maintained nothing had been sighted and the disconcerting possibility now began to impress itself upon me that if i continued to trust only to such an occurrence for our deliverance we might spend years waiting for that event most fortunately we had both thus far been blessed with perfect health but it seemed too much to expect that this immunity from sickness or accident should continue indefinitely and if both of us should chance to fall sick at the same time what would be the result something very like panic seized me at the thought of such a possibility i felt that i had been culpably foolish in relying so implicitly and for so long a time upon extraneous help and the conviction forced itself upon me that i must at once take steps to effect our own deliverance yet what could i do the first idea that had suggested itself to me after the wreck of the brigantine was to build some sort of a craft in which we could effect our escape to civilization but after considering the matter i had come to the conclusion that such an undertaking would be altogether beyond my powers with only billy to assist me no doubt i was helped to this conclusion by the conviction i then felt that something would certainly heave in sight within the next month or two to take us off but with the lapse of time my confidence had insensibly waned and i had accordingly set to work to make our stay upon the group as comfortable as might be now however i felt constrained to reconsider my original conclusion and as a preliminary i took pencil and paper drawing instruments and scale and proceeded to make tentative sketches of such a craft as i considered essential to enable us to make the voyage in safety and with a reasonable amount of comfort to ensure these requirements i decided that the boat whatever her dimensions must be fully decked and that she must be powerful enough to face and successfully battle with the whole gale of wind also she must be capable of being handled by billy and myself taking these requirements as a basis i set to work upon my sketches the relative dimensions of the boat would be governed to a considerable extent by her rig a cutter rigged craft is more powerful than any other but it is open to the objection that the mainsail the cutter's most important sail is an awkward sail to handle in a sudden emergency if the craft happens to be short-handed as we should be i believed however that this difficulty might be overcome by watchfulness and the taking of timely precautions therefore after weighing the matter carefully i decided in favor of the cutter rig bearing all the requirements in mind i set to work 
and ultimately evolved a design for a craft thirty feet long on the water line by ten feet beam and six feet draft of water aft to build a boat of these dimensions with only billy to help me was a sufficiently ambitious project but i had learned a good deal while building our existing boat and after all i felt sure that if i should need more manpower bowata would willingly lend me some of his people also realizing that henceforth billy and i would be fully occupied in building the new boat the thought occurred to me that it was high time to secure such domestic help as would enable us to give our whole time and thought to our work without troubling about such matters as cooking house cleaning and so on such help could only be obtained through bowata i therefore decided to seize an early opportunity to interview him upon the whole matter meanwhile however now that i had at last determined to attempt the building of a sea-going boat i was all impatience to make a beginning and as i further came to the conclusion that the beginning so far as the framing of the keel stem and stern post was concerned must be made aboard the wreck where all the materials were at hand we lost no time in again removing ourselves with all necessary goods and chattels to what remained of the yorkshire lass here i made a start by laying out full size in chalk upon the after-deck an accurate outline of the keel stem and stern post which greatly facilitated my work my chief difficulty i discovered was to find bolts at once of the required length and the necessary strength since i could not possibly make them and this difficulty absorbed so much time that we spent nearly a month on the wreck before the keel stem and stern post were framed together in readiness to be set up on the beach at eden where i intended to do the remainder of the work the framework was much too big and heavy to be conveyed to eden otherwise than by towing and as the whole trip was more or less a beat to windward the transport of it cost us two days our arrival home occurring so late in the afternoon that there was no time to attempt anything further that day but on the day following i sailed over to bowata's island and explained to him my requirements finding him more than eager to do anything and everything he could to oblige me the domestic question was very easily arranged bowata suggesting that i should employ a man whom he could especially recommend and who with his two wives would be able to do everything required in that particular direction while as for labor for the building of the cutter he assured me i might have as many men as i wished for as long a time as i needed them nothing could be more satisfactory than this the only point i felt doubtful about being the domestic part of the arrangement but billy settled this by undertaking to supervise the work until the man and his wife should be trained to efficiency and the plan when put into operation worked excellently the keel of the new boat being now ready the next thing was to set it up accurately plumb longitudinally and transversely upon the building blocks and to do this i obtained the loan of twenty natives for a day for the keel with stem and stern posts attached was much too heavy a mass of timber for billy and me to manipulate without assistance and with their help the work was most satisfactorily accomplished they doing the manual work under billy's guidance while i supervised and directed the adjustments that were frequently necessary i next set up five stout moulds one at the midship section of the boat with two aft and two forward of it giving the exact shape of the boat at those points and to the moulds i firmly attached several temporary whales and stringers thus obtaining a kind of skeleton giving an accurate idea of the form of the finished boat and when i had got thus far with my work and inspected the result from various viewpoints i was as much amazed at my own audacity in attempting so ambitious an undertaking as i was gratified at the appearance which it presented for i saw before me the outline of a very shapely yacht-like little ship that if i knew anything of such matters promised to be fast weatherly and a very fine sea-boat quite capable of taking care of herself when hove to even in a heavy gale of wind <laughs>
it was my intention to plank her upon the diagonal principle using three thicknesses of comparatively thin plank for i had no means by which to steam a single layer of planking of the necessary thickness and so render it pliable enough to bend to the correct shape while i believe that by using thin plank i could bend it to shape unsteamed i am getting somewhat ahead of my yarn however for the progress outlined above represented nearly three months hard work an appreciable proportion of which had to be done a second time owing to my inexperience with the accession of our black helpers our domestic arrangements flourished exceedingly the only difficulty we experienced in connection with them occurring during the first fortnight or three weeks after their arrival the trouble arising with kit who violently resented their intrusion and had to be kept strictly tied up until he had learned to understand that he must in no wise interfere with them but even after reaching this stage the natives had to be exceedingly careful how they conducted themselves in his presence for he never advanced farther than the merest toleration of them while when any of the other blacks were on eden assisting me to build the cutter it was absolutely necessary to keep the beast closely confined to the house until they had left i very soon made the discovery that had i been obliged to depend solely upon the efforts of billy and myself i should have been compelled to abandon the idea of building the cutter at a very early stage of the operations it was not so much that we had found the work beyond our strength although in that respect we were often glad enough to have a little additional help but it was often necessary to have a plank or a whaling or some such matter held firmly in position at half a dozen points or more at the same moment while i fixed it and it was on such occasions that i welcomed the assistance of the natives and as such occasions occurred pretty frequently it happened that i was kept au courant with everything of importance and with a great deal that was exceedingly unimportant that occurred on cliff island thus i came to know that contrary to hope and expectation the arming of the natives with bows and arrows with the resulting destruction of the raiding apes had been absolutely ineffective in checking the raids which were now occurring more frequently and in greater force than ever it appeared almost as though the brutes were possessed of sufficient intelligence to understand that something had happened rendering it no longer possible for attacks by small numbers to be successful and that they were strengthening their attacking forces accordingly with the evident determination to succeed ultimately at whatever cost i was greatly vexed to hear this for it was evident that the existence of such formidable beasts in the group consisted a growing menace to the human life in it and i was wondering how this menace was to be fought when bawata and his people without consulting me made an attempt to solve the problem which for a short time at least seemed to be crowned with success it was the height of summer and there had been a spell of some six weeks of very hot dry weather when on a certain morning as billy and i with some natives were at work upon the cutter the lad directed my attention to a thin cloud of light brownish blue smoke rising in the air beyond cliff island there was a gentle easterly breeze blowing at the time sweeping the smoke away in the direction of west island and as we watched the cloud rapidly increased in density its color darkened and somewhat to my astonishment it seemed to spread in an easterly direction or against the wind it soon became clear that it was the forest on apes island that had caught fire and it was equally evident that thanks to the long dry spell and to the fanning of the easterly breeze the fire was spreading with great rapidity for within twenty minutes of the appearance of the first light film of smoke we were able to see over the eastern extremity of cliff island the flames speeding up the hillside toward the conical summit of the island preceded by so vast a volume of smoke that it completely veiled the hills of west island from our sight while billy and i stood watching the rapid march of the flames one of the natives noticing our interest in the spectacle approached and informed us that bawata and one of his sons determined to drive the apes off apes island 
had that morning crossed apes channel in the punt which i had given them with the avowed intention of setting the entire island on fire beginning at its northern extremity in order to drive the apes away from that part of the island from whence they were wont to start to swim the channel and thence working round the shore to the eastern extremity of the island hoping thus to drive the anthropoids in a westerly and southerly direction right away from cliff island as apes island was everywhere densely covered with forest and undergrowth it was exceedingly probable that unless something unforeseen occurred to extinguish the fire every living thing upon it would be destroyed except such creatures as might essay to swim the middle channel and take refuge upon west island but as the day progressed and the fire advanced spreading ever more rapidly as great volumes of sparks were borne by the wind on ahead of the main body of flame kindling subsidiary fires in advance i began to doubt whether west island would escape remembering as i did that there was a stretch of the middle channel which was little more than half a mile wide across which such a tremendous volume of sparks as now filled the air might easily be wafted toward evening my anticipation in this respect was verified for upon ascending to the summit of our own peak on eden at the conclusion of our day's work we saw that not only was the surface of apes island an unbroken expanse of black smoking ashes and charred tree stumps but that the fire had leapt middle channel and practically the whole eastern side of west island was a mass of flame the destruction of life would of course be enormous but such glimpses as had thus far been afforded us of the animal life upon the group seemed to indicate that it was inimical to mankind and if its destruction involved that of the apes it was not to be greatly regretted i waited three days to allow the ashes to cool and then taking billy with me sailed for the middle channel running the boat ashore on apes island at a spot where a stream of fresh water discharged into the narrowest part of the channel here we landed and started to walk eastward over and through ashes that were ankle deep and in places still unpleasantly hot i was quite prepared to find evidences that the destruction of animal life had been tremendous but even so i was amazed at the innumerable scorched and shriveled carcasses of creatures that had made their way to the water's edge and had there perished probably suffocated by the smoke because they had feared to take to the water they lay thick upon the ground huddled together as far as the eye could reach to the right and left of the spot where we landed and the odor of burnt flesh was almost overpowering while flies and birds swarmed about them in legions the remains were mostly so far consumed as to be impossible of identification but here and there we came upon what judging from the skull and teeth had once been a creature of the cat tribe probably a leopard while the skeletons of snakes some of them from their dimensions evidently pythons were numerous we also came upon several carcasses of what i thought might have been boars but if they were the creatures must have been huge specimens of their kind there were also a few calcine skeletons of animals that must have been as big as or bigger than a british dray horse but of a very different build they did not suggest any animal with which i was acquainted and i was quite unable to put a name to them we walked two miles or more inland before turning back but nowhere did i see anything suggesting the destruction of so much as a solitary ape at which i was nowise surprised for i felt sure that the apes at least would be able to keep well ahead of the fire and make good their escape to west island but west island was like apes island a fire black and ruined as far as the eye could see toward both the north and the south and if the fire had swept clean across the island to its western shore it would mean another holocaust in which the apes also would be involved for there was no retreat no sanctuary beyond west island it was too late to push our investigations farther that day but i resolved that on the morrow i would see what the western side of west island looked like accordingly eight o'clock in the morning of the following day found billy and me emerging from the northwest channel into the lagoon 
and hauling round to the southward to skirt the western shore of west island we needed not to travel so far as this however to discover that at least part of west island had escaped the ravages of fire for upon our arrival off the southwestern extremity of cliff island we saw that owing to the greatly increased width of the middle channel at that point the direction of the wind and the peculiar configuration of the island itself an area which i roughly estimated at about a hundred square miles at its northern extremity had been untouched by the flames and this area of forest although probably little more than a quarter of that of the whole island would still afford cover for a good many animals had they the sense or the instinct to escape to it it was not until we had rounded the northern extremity of west island and had followed the west coast southward for a distance of about eleven miles that we again came upon the ruin wrought by the flames which we found had swept right across the island leaving the area above referred to untouched while to the southward as far as the eye could see all was black ruin and desolation at this point too signs of the devastation wrought upon the animal life of the island began to reveal themselves in the shape first of isolated carcasses and then of groups of the same rapidly becoming more numerous and more crowded as the boat glided along southward within a stone's throw of the beach as i was exceedingly anxious to discover whether or not the apes had escaped the destruction that had overtaken the other creatures inhabiting the two fire-stricken islands we landed at various points along the beach and made short investigating excursions inland coming upon the remains of animals and reptiles of several different kinds the variety indeed was astonishing including i regretted to see two or three varieties of deer and at length we found the half-consumed carcasses of three apes close together but we found no more that day it was by this time drawing on toward sunset accordingly we made sail for the wreck of the brigantine and took up our quarters aboard her for the night early on the following morning we resumed our inspection of west island starting at the point where we had left off on the previous evening and on this day we came upon the remains of two more apes several miles apart but although those five carcasses of apes were all that we found it was of course quite possible that there might have been many more for our excursions inland were necessarily of very limited extent to have made anything approaching a complete examination of the burnt area would have been the work of weeks rather than of days and i was indisposed to devote very much time to such an undertaking moreover the effluvium arising from so many rapidly decomposing carcasses was of itself a sufficient deterrent but slight and limited as was our examination it sufficed to prove that the island must have literally swarmed with animal life several species of which were as in the case of those found on apes island quite new to me and late in the day having extended our walk to the crest of a hill we discovered that there was a little south of the middle of the island a triangular shaped lake about six miles long by about five miles broad at its western end that had served to protect and preserve a clump of forest about two miles long and the sounds that proceeded from it indicated that many animals had found sanctuary there by the time that we had completed our survey it was too late to think of returning to eden that day so we again bore up for the wreck spending the night aboard her and returning to our own island on the day following on our way back i touched at cliff island and had a chat with Bawata, relating to him the result of our trip of inspection i told him that we had seen very few dead apes and hazarded the conjecture that the brutes retreating before the flames on their own island had swum the middle channel to west island on the northern and unburnt portion of which they might have established themselves but when he suggested that this portion also of the island should be set on fire to make assurance doubly sure i very strongly demurred pointing out that even if my conjecture should be correct the unburned forest would doubtless be swarming with animal life other than that of the apes 
and that it would be a very great pity to destroy it all in order to effect the extermination of the apes unless such a drastic measure should prove to be imperatively necessary after the little break following upon the firing of apes island i returned with enthusiasm to work upon the cutter and in the course of a month used up all the available material which i had thus far accumulated necessitating another visit to the wreck to obtain more i collected as large a quantity as i believed i could conveniently handle and forming it into a raft took it in tow for transport to eden the passage that under ordinary conditions could easily be accomplished in a single day occupied five days and was i think the toughest job i had ever undertaken in my life the raft being so deadly sluggish in movement that it was impossible to tow it to windward and i finally found myself compelled to kedge it more than half the way but i was glad when i had at length brought it safely into the cove and anchored it there for i now had enough material to carry on with for at least four months i estimated that another raft of equal size would suffice to complete the cutter and notwithstanding the difficulties that i had just encountered i felt strongly inclined to return forthwith to the wreck and procure a sufficiency for all future needs but i was very tired after my labors and i finally persuaded myself to postpone the task for a while to my subsequent intense regret the anniversary of the wreck of the yorkshire lass arrived and passed we had been a whole year on the group and so far as we knew not a solitary sail of any description had come within sight of the islands during the whole of those twelve months it was an astounding incomprehensible fact i had never really anticipated such a possibility with the passage of each day each week each month i had said to myself with gradually waning assurance certainly it cannot be long now before a craft of some sort comes along to take us off until the moment when it suddenly dawned upon me that if we were ever to escape it must be through our own efforts my own especially this conviction now came upon me with overwhelming force my hopes of deliverance by means of some extraneous agency suddenly sank to zero and i began to work with such febrile energy that it presently drew from billy a steadily growing flood of remonstrance i had by this time expended so much of my material that i was in the very act of preparing for another visit to the wreck to obtain more when poor billy fell sick of some sort of a fever within three hours of his seizure he became delirious and was so extremely violent that he being by this time a strong sturdy boy i was obliged to at once drop everything else to look after him and see that he did not injure himself during the more severe paroxysms of course i had long ago taken the precaution to secure possession of the ship's medicine chest with its accompanying book of instructions but the latter afforded me little help for i could find in it no case the symptoms of which quite corresponded with those of my patient and i was therefore compelled to rely very much upon my own judgment and upon the instructions for the treatment of fevers in general a liberal administration of quinine seemed to constitute the most hopeful form of treatment and luckily we possessed an ample supply of the drug i accordingly dosed billy with it for close upon sixty hours when the delirium ceased and the poor boy sank into a semi-stupor of exhaustion which enabled one of the native women to relieve me by watching at the patient's bedside i had by this time been without sleep for two nights and more than three days and i was therefore glad enough to be free to retire to my own room to rest for an hour or two arrived there i removed my boots and then without troubling to remove further clothing flung myself upon my bed and instantly sank into complete oblivion end of chapter twelve Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurney, Illinois.
Chapter 13 of The Strange Adventures of Eric Blackburn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melissa Jean. The Strange Adventures of Eric Blackburn by Harry Collingwood. Chapter 13 We Exterminate the Apes. I was aroused to consciousness by the flash of dazzling light upon my closed eyelids, accompanied by the crash of a terrific clap of thunder. Opening my eyes, I discovered that the room was in opaque darkness, showing that I must have been allowed to sleep at least eight hours. But even as I swung my feet to the floor and started to grope for my boots, while the reverberations of the thunderclap still rumbled and echoed in the distance, there came another blinding flash of lightning, instantly followed by a deafening crash of thunder and getting my bearings by the illumination of the lighting i started to my feet and forgetting my boots rushed to billy's bedside apprehensive of what might be be the effect of the storm upon him i found the patient not only awake but also in his right mind well billy my boy how are you by this time i demanded i'm i believe i'm better thank you mr blackburn replied the boy but i feel very weak and oh goodness isn't it hot it was I had just found time to become aware of the excessive heat and closeness of the atmosphere. The perspiration was simply streaming from every pore of my body, and I felt suffocating for want of sufficient air. All the doors and windows of the bungalow were wide open, but the atmosphere was absolutely stagnant, the naked flame of a newly ignited lamp burning without the faintest flicker. One of our native domestics was now busying herself arranging the table in what we called the dining room, and in laying out the materials for a supper for me for it now appeared that I had slept for nearly fourteen hours on end, and the good woman insisted that I must have a meal at once. While these preparations were in progress, I went out and stood under the veranda to take a look at the weather. The thunderclap that had broken in upon my slumbers proved to be the prelude to a terrific electrical disturbance, which was now in full action. The centre of the disturbance appeared to be almost immediately overhead, for flash after flash of lightning was striking all around the house, while the detonations of the thunder were continuous and so violent that I felt the floor literally tremble beneath my feet. But the lightning was not confined to discharges from the cloud overhead. It was darting earthward all around us, and practically at all distances from zenith to horizon. And so frequent were the discharges that the illumination from them was continuous, revealing a vault packed with enormous masses of heavy, black, writhing cloud, I stood for perhaps five minutes, fascinated by the spectacle of the vivid lightning play, and then, just as the native woman came out to announce that my supper was ready, down came the rain in a perfect deluge, and in a moment the eaves of the house, the foliage of the trees, and the earth itself poured with soft, warm water. It was too good an opportunity to be wasted, so I hurried to my own room, threw off my clothes, seized a morsel of soap, and dashing out to the midst of the downpour treated myself to a most delightful and refreshing bath as a preliminary to supper the rain continued for about half an hour and then it ceased with that abruptness which seems so characteristic of the tropics but it had scarcely come to an end when there arose a loud rustling of leaves among the trees in the garden and round about the house a blast of hot wind poured in through the open doors and windows violently slamming the former and causing the latter to rattle furiously I had barely time to rush and close them all when a terrific squall came roaring down upon the bungalow. This squall was only the precursor of several that followed each other at rapidly decreasing intervals, until those intervals became so brief as to be no longer distinguishable, and the wind settled into a roaring gale from the westward that blew all night and did not break until close upon noon the next day. As luck would have it, I had chosen the eastern slope of the peak as the site upon which to erect the bungalow, consequently the structure was to a very great extent sheltered from the gale by the hill behind it but even so the building quivered and shook under the stroke of the blasts and my heart sank as i thought of the wreck for i felt that she had not one chance in a thousand of weathering it out she was on what was now the windward reef as it had been when she struck upon it the surf would pile up on the reef again raising the level of the water by perhaps three or four feet and in that case the poor old Yorkshire lass would be washed off to the coral into the lagoon, and would there sink, and with her would go all the material that I needed for the completion of the cutter. Then there was the cutter herself, or at least as much of her as had thus far been put together. How would she stand the buffeting to which she was being subjected? I was hopeful, for she was at this time merely a skeleton, and a very imperfect skeleton at that. Consequently, there would not be much for the wind to take hold of, Yet I was anxious, too, 
for I feared lest the heavy rain might have displaced some of the keel blocks, and so let the craft down, and perhaps strained her out of shape. So anxious, indeed, was I that I would have gone down to the cove at once, despite the fury of the wind. But the night was so pitch dark that I could have seen nothing, nor single-handed could have done anything, whatever might have happened. So I was perforce obliged to defer my visit until daylight. But when daylight came, I fought my way down to the cove against the gale that was still blowing, and there found my inexpressible relief that nothing had happened but what could be put right in an hour or two. I was naturally most anxious to ascertain what, if anything, had happened to the wreck, but it was not until nearly a week after the gale that Billy had progressed so far toward recovery that I was able to leave him entirely in the care of the natives. When, however, that moment arrived, I took immediate advantage of it, starting for the scene of the wreck immediately after an early breakfast, and enjoining Billy not to be anxious should I be detained until the next day. With a fair wind, all the way the boat made short miles of the trip, and I reached the scene of the wreck fairly early in the afternoon. But at least an hour before my arrival, my worst fears were realized, for where the wreck had once been, there was now no sign of her. But I knew pretty well where to look for her, and coasting along the inner edge of the reef, I ultimately came upon her within a few fathoms of the reef, sunk in six fathoms of water, and of course irrevocably lost to us. I thought, however, that possibly some useful wreckage might be floating about the lagoon, I therefore worked the boat over to West Island Beach, near to which I did indeed find a few planks and some small odds and ends that had broken adrift or floated off when the wreck went down, and these I formed into a small raft, which I towed round to Eden on the following day. But when I looked from the skeleton of the cutter to the small quantity of material available for her completion, my heart sank within me, and I felt utterly discouraged, for what I had was ridiculously inadequate. It was not enough even to complete the shell of the craft, and where on earth was I to get more? There were, of course, thousands of trees on the group, and I had an axe with which to fell them, but when they were felled, how was I to convert them into plank and scantling? It was a problem which I puzzled over during the whole day succeeding my return to Eden, seeking in vain for a solution, until at last it seemed that we were really doomed to remain where we were until taken off by a ship, even though we should grow old while awaiting her arrival. Such a conclusion would doubtless have been terribly discouraging to many people, but after the first shock, its effect upon me was, on the contrary, so provocative that I resumed work upon the cutter with more resolution than ever, if that were possible, until, some six weeks later, I had used up all my available material, and my work was perforce brought to a standstill. But when this happened, I had made such progress that the cutter was planked up to the gunwale with the first thickness of planking and so thoroughly satisfied was I with my work that I was determined nothing should prevent its completion, even though, to provide the necessary material, I should be compelled to pull down the bungalow and break up our sailing boat. Such forcible measures as those, however, demanded the most careful consideration before adoption. Meanwhile, the rank luxuriance of tropical plant growth had already changed the fire-blackened areas of apes and west islands to varying tints of delicate green, the several varieties of new vegetation seeming to find congenial conditions in the thick coat of ashes resulting from the fire. But I learned from Bawada, whose people had been maintaining a close watch upon both islands, that thus far no signs of animal life had been detected upon either of them, although the chief agreed with me that whatever might be the case with Apes Island, West Island, or at least the unburnt part of it, must be simply swarming with living creatures and the conviction that this was so was causing him and his people so much uneasiness that a permanent watch had been established at the western end of cliff island and the natives resident there to the number of forty had all been armed with bows and arrows that they might be prepared to repel possible incursions of apes from that part of west island the channel at that point being but little wider than that which the apes were wont to swim when crossing from their own island the liability to incursions by the apes seemed to be the only source of anxiety on the part of Bowata and his people. In all other respects, they appeared to be perfectly happy, for their wants were few, and so fertile was the soil of their own island that it amply supplied all those wants, with very little exertion on the part of the easy-going inhabitants. The trouble was that the products of their industry unfortunately appealed so strongly to the appetite of the anthropods that, to gratify it, the brutes were willing to swim a channel a mile wide and the trouble was serious enough in all conscience, for as I gradually learned in the course of frequent conversations with the chief, the apes not only destroyed far more than they ate, but until my introduction of the bow and arrow's weapon, they were only driven off with the utmost difficulty, 
and frequently with serious loss of life on the part of the savages. It was indeed to put an effectual end to those frequent raids upon their property that the natives, in desperation, had finally resorted to the drastic measure of setting fire to the island that harboured the monsters. The longer I meditated upon the problem of how to meet the shortage of material for the completion of the cutter, the more reluctant did I become to resort to so extreme a measure as the breaking up of the sailing boat, still more to the bungalow, to supply the deficiency. In my perplexity, I visited East Island, and here a possible way out of the difficulty was suggested to me by the discovery, as I then for the first time particularly noticed, that certain of the trees flourishing on that island appeared to be, if not actually cedars, at least a species very nearly akin thereto. And if upon closer investigation this should prove to be the case, here is a supply of timber admirably suited to my requirements and ample beyond my utmost needs. It was a matter worthy of my most particular attention, and accordingly I selected a group of the supposed cedars, and forthwith proceeded to operate upon them. They were three in number, of just about the right size for my requirements, and they were within a quarter mile of the cove. I began my investigation by hacking off a good stout branch, stripping off its bark, and testing its working qualities. I found that the wood gave off the characteristic odor of cedar, that it was close-grained, that it was easily workable, and that it was, in short, everything I could possibly desire. I therefore started work in earnest by felling the tree that I had already attacked and trimming off its branches. This brought my day's work to a close, and I returned to Eden with a mind relieved of a heavy load of anxiety, for there was now no longer any need to contemplate the breaking up of either the boat or the bungalow. True, I had found the wood I required, but what I needed was thin planks, not heavy bulks of timber, such as one might be able to hew out of a tree trunk with an axe. And how was I to obtain those planks? I considered the matter, and suddenly remembered that cedar splits easily. I therefore determined to ascertain by actual experiment whether it would be possible to procure the planks I required by splitting the felled trunk. The experiment was on the whole successful, for although I wasted more timber than I anticipated, I nevertheless succeeded in securing several very fine planks that, when operated upon with the plane, could be reduced to the exact thickness required. Thus encouraged, I made an estimate of the quantity of planking required to complete the hull of the cutter, and then proceeded to fell as many trees as were needed to furnish that quantity. It was while I was thus engaged that I one day received an urgent visit from Bawada and his son, who came in great distress to inform me that the watchers posted on the western extremity of Cliff Island to guard against a surprise attack on the part of the apes, believed to have retreated to West Island, had that morning reported that the anthropoids were recrossing the middle channel to Apes Island, and that from observation of the creature's movements, it was strongly suspected that they meditated an attack in force upon Cliff Island and its inhabitants. Bowata concluded his communication with an entreaty that I would lend my aid to repel the threatened attack. I at once acceded to this request, and with the two natives aboard the sailing boat and their punt in tow, proceeded to Eden, where I collected all the arms and ammunition we possessed, and taking Billy with me, made sail for Cliff Island. As we approached the northern extremity of Apes Island, from which point the brutes usually started on their swim across the channel to Cliff Island, my telescope revealed numerous apes clustered together upon the beach, while many others could be seen wending their way toward the same spot but I could see none in the water, so concluded that the threatened raid had not yet started. I inquired of Bowata how many of his people were now armed with bows and arrows, and was gratified to learn that every male above the age of fifteen had so been armed. This meant that there were more than a hundred archers to defend the island, learning which I came to the conclusion that the best form of defense was attack, and made my plans accordingly. Landing Bowata and his son to conduct the defense of their island, I took aboard the boat seven natives, who the chief assured me were among his most expert bowmen, and headed across the channel toward Apes Island, my plan being to cruise to and fro opposite the spot where the apes were mustering, and to pick off as many of the brutes as possible while passing. At this point, the channel was only about a mile wide. Ten minutes, therefore, sufficed us to accomplish the passage, and to round two at a distance of twenty yards from the beach, where some fifty or sixty of the gigantic brutes were now assembled, most of them squatting up on their haunches, as though awaiting the signal of some sport, while others were joining them at the rate of two or three per minute. As the boat approached, the monsters eyed her malignantly, while several rose to their feet as though preparing to repel an attack. This suited our purpose well, 
and as the boat, under Billy's skillful handling, rounded to into the wind with her sails a shiver, glided slowly past the spot where the apes were congregated, we each deliberately selected our target, and drawing our bows to the full length of our arrows, let fly with deadly effect. Every arrow went home, many of them finding the heart, and with screams of mingled pain and rage, eight of the apes crashed to the ground, a few of them writhing convulsively in their death agony, but most of them dead. There was time for a second discharge before the boat drifted too far away, and three more of the brutes went down, while five of their comrades, screaming and bellowing with pain and rage, wrenched the arrows from their wounds, some of them in their blind fury turning upon and savagely attacking their fellows. The maneuver was so successful that it was repeated with equally satisfactory results. Thus far the unwounded apes appeared to take little or no notice of the havoc we were working among them, and I feel certain that none of them connected that havoc with the appearance of the boat upon the scene. But when the maneuver was repeated a third time, and still more of their number fell dead or wounded, it seemed at last to dawn upon their imperfect intelligence that the strange object with its white sails, which glided to and fro upon the water opposite them, must somehow be associated with the casualties occurring among their companions, and with yells of concentrated fury and eyes ablaze with deadly malice, about a dozen of them shambled down the beach into the water, and striking out started to swim in the pursuit of the boat. Nothing could have suited us better than this senseless act of the great anthropoids, for although they swam fast, the boat could easily outdistance them in the breeze then blowing, and I signed to Billy to edge away toward a wider part of the channel, so that, when they should discover how impossible it was to overtake the boat, they might have the farther to swim, should any of them escape us and attempt to make their way across to Cliff Island. But the precaution was unnecessary, for when they were in the water and swimming, we could do so as we would with them, and within a few minutes every ape that had started in pursuit of the boat was slain. By this time, however, others had also taken to the water, there being now at least thirty of them swimming, some in pursuit of the boat, while others headed directly across the channel towards Cliff Island. This necessitated an alteration of our plans, yet we still contrived to keep the boat between the apes and the island, crossing and recrossing in front of the brutes at a distance of five to ten yards, so that it was impossible for us to miss them. Thus the slaughter went on until my very soul revolted at such terrible destruction, for the brutes continued to come on by dozens and scores until there seemed to be no end of them. Most creatures would have had intelligence enough to recognize that their persistence meant death to them, and would have turned back, either discouraged or terrified, but the ape seemed to be incapable of either emotion, and pressed resolutely on, so that their destruction became imperative if the natives of Cliff Island were not to be abandoned to their tender mercies. But that sort of thing could not go on forever. The number of the brutes gradually decreased, and at the end of about three hours, the last ape in sight succumbed to our attack, and it then appeared probable that we had exterminated the entire tribe of the dangerous and formidable creatures. End of chapter 13「The Strange Adventures of Eric Blackburn」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melissa Jean The Strange Adventures of Eric Blackburn by Harry Collingwood Chapter 14 Attacked by Chinese Pirates The destruction of the apes accomplished, I returned with avidity to the task of felling cedar trees on the East Island and splitting the chunks into planks for the completion of the cutter, for I had by this time entirely abandoned the hope of rescue by a passing ship. It was about three weeks later that emerging on a certain morning from my bedroom and stepping out to the veranda to scan the offing, according to custom, before beginning the regular routine of the day, my gaze was instantly arrested by an object poised on the very verge of the horizon some twelve miles distant. Showing up almost black against the vivid hues of the early morning eastern sky, it was yet too small to be capable of identification by the unassisted eye. I therefore darted back into the house, and procuring the telescope, brought it to bear upon the stranger, and as I focused the image of that distant object in the lenses of my instruments, I experienced a moment of most bitter disappointment. For when my gaze fell first upon that tiny speck, the thought instantly left my mind that at long last the moment of our deliverance had arrived whereas a moment or two later my telescope revealed to me the disconcerting fact that the craft in sight and heading straight for the group was a Chinese junk. 
It may be that certain of my readers will wonder why the approach of a Chinese junk to the group should cause me such acute disappointment, and they may perhaps ask the question, is not a Chinese junk as capable as any other vessel of rescuing shipwrecked people and conveying them back to civilization? To this question I would reply, yes, undoubtedly, under certain circumstances. But let me explain the provisio implied in that reply. Had the boy Billy and I only been concerned, I would have trusted ourselves aboard the junk. But there was the treasure to be considered. I was not altogether ignorant concerning the character and reputation of Chinese sailors. There may be, and probably are, Chinamen who are as honorable, upright, and honest as the average Englishman. But my experience, such as it has been, is that they are not to be found aboard a junk. The Chinese seaman is, as a rule, drawn from the lowest stratum of his people, and among such men the moral sense, if not absolutely lacking, is very nearly so. They are barbarian, and all their instincts are primitive. Honor and honesty are words that have no meaning for them. They are, before all things else, intensely acquisitive, and if they want a thing, they will take it if they can, and will betide the owner if he resists them. In a word, the Chinese seaman is by instinct a pirate, and a cruel, bloodthirsty one at that. Hence my feeling of disappointment at the sight of that junk, for how could I hope that our treasure would remain involatile if placed in the power of such men as I have endeavoured to describe? They would cut our throats without scruple in order to possess themselves the contents of our chests, the very appearance of which was irresistibly suggestive of treasure. It took me not a moment to determine that, rather than expose ourselves to such possible risks, we would have nothing whatever to do with the junk if we could avoid it. But could we? The junk was heading straight for the group, running before a light easterly breeze which would probably give her a speed of about three knots, and in the course of the next three hours she would be close enough to enable her crew to see the bungalow, the existence of which it was impossible to conceal, built as it was high up on the hillside with a passage through the reef immediately opposite it. Was it at all reasonable to suppose that any craft would sail past the group without calling to investigate? There was, of course, the possibility that the junk in sight might be perfectly harmless, and that if she entered the lagoon, it would be merely to satisfy curiosity, and perhaps to obtain a little fruit or to replenish her stock of fresh water. And, if so, well and good. But if not, if her crew happened to be composed of such ruffians as I have endeavoured to picture, what then? Could I hope that they would be satisfied merely to come up to the bungalow, ask a few questions in picked in English, and depart, leaving us unscathed? To suppose any such thing would be, to say the least of it, foolishness. The probability was that they would attack us, sack the place, carrying away everything that took their fancy, including the treasure chests, murder me and Billy, and burn down the house out of sheer love of destruction. These reflections which have taken me so long to record flash through my mind upon the instant following my recognition of the character of the stranger, and realization of the danger that possibly threatened us naturally led to the question, how is that danger to be averted? Could Billy and I alone hope to put up a successful defense against an attack by perhaps thirty or forty determined men? For let Chinamen be what they may in other respects, they are not easily daunted by a sense of personal danger, especially if animated by the hope of plunder. Then in a moment there came to me the memory of Bawada and the natives of Cliff Island. They had been most profuse in their expressions of gratitude for the help which we had afforded them from time to time and had repeatedly declared their eagerness to find an opportunity to give practical demonstration of that gratitude. Here was their opportunity, and all that was needed was to make them aware of it. I took another long look at the junk, and came to the conclusion that she would not reach the lagoon in much less than four hours, which would allow me time to make a single trip in the boat to Cliff Island, get into touch with Boada, secure his assistance, and return to Eden with my dusky reinforcements. I decided to do so, and without waiting for breakfast, at once started for the cove, and the boat. The wind being fair, I made a quick run across to Cliff Island, and a swift-footed native boy soon brought Bowada down to the landing place where we usually met. Explaining the circumstances to him, I found him, as I had quite anticipated, more than ready to render me every possible assistance, and departing to muster his men, he returned in a very short time with nineteen of his most reliable fighters. The boat's utmost capacity was twenty, in addition to myself, and the chief naturally elected to accompany and head his party. Those men Bawada assured me were the pick of the entire tribe, and I quite believed him, for although small and slight compared with the average Englishman, they were lithe, wiry, active, and resolute-looking men, with an eager gleam in their eyes which seemed to suggest that the prospect of a fight was the reverse of a distasteful to them. They were each armed with a bow, a quiver full of arrows, and 
and a most formidable-looking war club, the head of which was thickly studded with bone spikes, and which promised to be terribly effective at close quarters. The latter being quite a recent addition to their armory, invented by Bowata's son, whose imagination had at last been stimulated by the persistent attacks of the apes. The return passage to Eden, half of which was a deadbeat to windward, with the boat loaded to her utmost capacity, occupied so long a time that I was in a perfect fever of anxiety, lest the junk should arrive before us. But upon rounding the southeast point of Cliff Island, I was somewhat relieved to see that she had, so far, not entered the lagoon, nor did I see any sign of her during the remainder of the passage, for low down in the water as we were, the spray of the surf breaking upon the reef effectually veiled from our view everything outside. There was still no sign of the junk when at length the boat entered the little cove that was our usual landing place, and grounded on the beach. Ten minutes later we surmounted the crest of the ridge on the far side of which stood the bungalow, and I once more got a view of the open sea outside, over the curtain of everlasting spray that had obstructed my view from the boat. The junk was visible clearly enough, hove to at a distance of about a mile to windward of the reef. I hurried to the house for the telescope, that I might obtain a nearer view of what was happening aboard her. Seizing the telescope, I proceeded to the veranda, from which I brought the instrument to bear upon the craft. I now saw that she had lowered a boat that, manned by a crew of five, was heading for the opening in the reef immediately opposite our land. This boat I watched, keeping the telescope bearing upon her, as she alternately topped and disappeared behind the long ridges of swells, until at length she passed through the opening and entered the lagoon. Once through the reef, she headed straight for Eden, and it looked as though the men in her contemplated landing on the beach at the foot of the slope upon which the bungalow was built. Whereupon, I thought it well to hoist the brigantine's ensign upon the flagstaff I had set up in front of the bungalow, as a hint to the intruders that the island was British territory, and that its inhabitants expected that territory to be respected. The boat, approaching cautiously, at length reached a point about a quarter of a mile from the beach, when the crew lay upon their oars, while the man in the stern sheets rose to his feet and proceeded to subject Eden, and as much of the rest of the group as was visible, from his point of view, to a prolonged scrutiny, after which, at a sign from him, the oars again dipped in the water, and turning the boat recrossed the lagoon and made her way back to the junk. There is now a pause in the proceedings during which i conjectured that the man who had been in charge of the boat was making his report to his skipper the pause however was not of long duration for as i continued to watch signs of a sudden stir aboard the junk became perceptible and a few minutes later i saw that her crew were lowering two more boats much larger than the first and that a considerable number of men who so far as it was possible to see at a distance were all armed were swarming down the junk side into them this seemed to indicate that my worst suspicions regarding the character of the vessel were only too well founded, and that a pretty stiff fight was in prospect for us. If this should be so, it was time to see about making my dispositions for the conflict. I accordingly re-entered the house, and, girding on my cutlass, thrust a brace of fully loaded revolvers into my belt, seized my own pet rifle, and filling my jacket pockets with cartridges, sallied forth, and joined Bawada and his party, led them down to the beach. This particular strip of beach, it should be explained, was quite unlike the other beaches of the group. The latter, composed of white coral sand, were continuous, smooth, unencumbered, averaged from thirty feet wide in some cases to as much as a hundred feet wide in others, and usually sloped steeply enough to enable our boat, with good way on her, to run herself high enough on them to permit us to land dry-footed. On the other hand, the beach toward which we were now heading was a strip of coral sand not much more than a quarter of a mile long perfectly smooth but sloping so very gently that i much doubted whether the boats i had seen preparing to leave the junk could approach within fifty yards of the shore without grounding but the circumstance most greatly in our favour was that this comparatively short length of beach while inviting enough in appearance as a landing place was backed on its shore side with an outcrop of black rocks that offered splendid cover for a defending force while leaving attackers from the sea completely exposed these peculiarities of the shore rendered it morally certain that the beach itself would be the actual battleground in the coming conflict, and it was with the view to its decision there that I made my final arrangements, and posted Bowata and his men. Having done this to my satisfaction, I took my rifle and advanced to the beach, where I seated myself upon a detached fragment of rock and patiently awaited the developments. These proved to be somewhat slow in arriving, and the period of waiting was rendered all the more tedious from the fact that, low down on the beach as I now was, the continuous veil of spray flying over the reef effectually hid everything that might be happening to seaward. 
but at length after waiting for fully an hour for something to happen one of the chinese boats appeared in the gap in the reef closely followed by a second and a third the two leading boats were largest craft pulling eight oars each and they appeared to be carrying some fourteen or sixteen men each while the third was the much smaller craft that had already once entered the lagoon the crew of which seemed now to be augmented by three or four extra men once clear of the passage they formed in line abreast the smaller boat between the two big ones while one man doubtless the leader of the expedition stood in the stern sheets directing the movements of his little flotilla from time to time by a wave of his hand the distance across the lagoon at this point from the reef to the beach of eden was about a mile the boats were therefore not long in traversing the distance but i did not intend to allow our unwelcome visitors to land without a protest of some sort and at the same time giving them something in the nature of a warning i therefore waited until the boats had arrived within about two hundred yards of the beach when rising to my feet i discharged my rifle aiming to send the shot a few yards above the head of the leader who was still standing in the stern sheets of the smaller boat as though my rifle shot had been a signal the oarsmen of all three of the boats instantly ceased rowing and a tremendous jabbering arose among them which the leader silenced by raising his hand at the same time shouting what i took to be a sharp command the oarsmen dipped their starboard oars sweeping the three boats broadside on to the beach and the next moment for i was saluted by a shower of bullets and slugs from some twenty jingles for an instant the air all about me seemed to be full of lead but i was untouched and knowing that it would take them a minute or two to reload i wheeled about and crossing some half a dozen yards of open ground took cover behind a convenient rock as i did so the boats again wheeled into line abreast and with their crews excitedly jabbering and shouting to one another dashed toward the beach at full speed the leader drawing a most formidable looking sword and waving it above his head with shouts of encouragement to his men but as i had foreseen the boats advanced but with a few lengths farther when the two bigger ones stopped dead having grounded and several of their occupants unprepared for the sudden stoppage toppled over backwards creating great confusion among their comrades at this moment i whistled shrilly whereupon bowata and his merry men arose from behind their ambush among the rocks and taking deliberate aim poured into the boat a flight of arrows every one of which must have told so short was the range and so great was the confusion that ensued among the chinese meanwhile the smaller boat being of lighter draught continued to come stem on for the beach i was covering her with my rifle nicely resting in a notch on the rock in front of me and as she came fair end on i pressed the trigger and the two foremost oarsmen collapsed on their oars both of them evidently shot by the one bullet this naturally added to the confusion but the leader who appeared to exercise great influence over his men soon restored order and shouting a command to his followers caused those in the grounded boats to leap overboard where with the water nearly up to their waists they paused for a moment to discharge a second volley from their jingles then tossing their cumbersome firearms back into the boat they uttered a yell drew their swords and came charging helter-skelter through the water toward the beach this was the opportunity for boada and his party who with arrows ready fitted to their bowstrings again rose from behind their covering rocks and let fly at the enemy some of the arrows missed their mark but about three-quarters of them were effective one man i observed receiving no less than three shafts in his body and five of the enemy fell while others came staggering forward with arrows sunk deep in various parts of their anatomy the leader of the band however remained unhurt and he continued by shouts to urge his men forward to the attack it was evident that his followers derived great encouragement from his words and actions and that to put him hors de combat would practically be to win the battle therefore leaving my now empty rifle leaning against the rock behind which i had been crouching i drew my cutlass and advanced to meet the fellow determined to personally tackle him and put him out of action without loss of time he was a sufficiently formidable antagonist it must be admitted two inches taller than myself broad in proportion with an enormously massive chest and shoulders and great muscles that stood out like cables under the skin of his bare arms his features were typically tartar and his small eyes blazed with ferocity as waving his sword above his head he advanced with a shout of defiance to meet me meanwhile bowata and his followers poured in still another flight of arrows and then flinging down their bows they gripped their formidable war clubs and uttering weird yells charged across the sand and fell upon the chinamen as they emerged from the water I quite anticipated that the fight between the leader and myself would be a long and exceedingly tough one, but to my amazement it was begun and finished in a breath. 
the man came charging upon me with an uplifted sword his evident intention being to make a cut at my head that should finish me out of hand and indeed he very nearly accomplished his purpose for as i raised my cutlass to guard my head his blade descended upon it with terrific force and shore my weapon clean in two and if i had not at the same moment stepped nimbly aside i would have assuredly been cloven to the eyes as it was the descending weapon missed me by a hair breadth shearing a large hole in the sleeve of my shirt but not touching the skin scarcely realizing what was about but acting upon instinct or the impulse of the movement i suppose before my antagonist could again raise his weapon i violently thrust my severed blade into his face and as he staggered back with the force of the blow i whipped out my revolver and shot him through the head that ended the fight for as the man fell dead at my feet a shout of mingled horror and consternation arose from those chinese who happened to witness the incident and who thereupon incontinently turned and fled to their boats an example immediately followed by their comrades hotly pursued by blacks who piled their war clubs with terrible effect it was a disastrous adventure for the chinamen for only the total number engaged which i am estimated to be between thirty and forty only eleven escaped for i counted them on the other hand the casualties on our side were remarkably small numbering only seven wounded the wounds consisting entirely of sore cuts none of which was serious of those seven bowata happened to be one his wound consisting of a sword thrust through the upper part of the left arm i therefore took him and his six companions of misfortune up to the house to dress their wounds leaving the remainder of the party on the beach to collect the weapons and their spent arrows and to clear up generally my surgical duties occupied about an hour and a half and when all my patients had been attended to i sent them with billy down to the cove to be ferried across in the sailing boat to cliff island where no doubt their own people would look after them then remembering that there were wounded chinamen among those abandoned on the beach i started down to see what could be done for them for although a party of wounded and no doubt treacherous and vindictive chinks would be a most embarrassing charge to have on my hands common humanity demanded that they should not be left to perish miserably where they had fallen before however i had covered half the distance between the bungalow and the beach i met the remaining blacks marching triumphantly up the hill singing a song of victory and carrying not only their own recovered weapons but also several swords that they had taken from the fallen enemy they also brought the rifle that i had left on the beach and the sword scabbard and belt of the chinese leader which they solemnly handed over to me as the victor seeing that they had evidently been busy among the fallen i asked whether there were many wounded among the latter to which the man whom i was questioning replied no they were all dead pointing significantly to his blood-smeared war-club by way of explanation well it may perhaps seem inhuman to say it but i was not altogether sorry the men were undoubtedly pirates if not by profession pirates at least when opportunity seemed to be favourable they had attacked me deliberately and without provocation and but for the help of the blacks billy and i would unquestionably have been wiped out ten or a dozen of such men wounded would have been a terribly embarrassing charge for me to have assumed but it would have been still more embarrassing to have them about the place when they were again hale and strong no taking everything into consideration i was not altogether sorry that they had been put beyond the possibility of perpetrating further mischief meanwhile what had become of the drunk i had looked for her just before leaving the bungalow on my way back to the beach and i had sighted her some six miles off in the southeastern quarter heading to the southward close hauled by which i judged that no further trouble need be looked for from her but there were the dead on the beach to be disposed of without loss of time how could this disposal be best effected i considered the matter and presently hit upon a plan the chinese in their precipitate fight had abandoned two of their boats namely the small one and one of the bigger ones those two would be sufficient to contain the whole of the dead and having now decided upon my mode of procedure i led my little band of black warriors back to the beach and with their assistance transferred the dead chinamen to the two abandoned boats we had barely completed this gruesome task when billy returned with the sailing boat whereupon i boarded her sailed her round to the cove to the east beach took the chinese boats in tow and anchored them for the night under the lee of the northern extremity of eden the next day i again took the boats in tow and with a party of eight natives to help me towed them to the beach of north island where we buried the dead chinamen the smaller of the two boats i then presented to Boada in recognition of the assistance he had rendered me in repelling the attack by the chinese while the bigger one I kept for the sake of her materials, which would be valuable to me in the completion of the cutter. 
It was while clearing up and putting matters generally straight after the Chinaman's unwelcome visit that the sword of the leader again came under my notice, and impelled by curiosity, I drew the weapon from its sheath and subjected it to a somewhat critical examination. For if that should prove satisfactory, I intended to make use of it in future, in place of the cutlass, the blade of which it had shorn through with such perfect ease. I found it to be somewhat heavier than the cutlass, the blade being considerably thicker than that of the other weapon, though not quite so wide. It was, however, perfectly balanced, and I was able to wield it with the utmost ease, while it was literally as keen-edged as a razor, and so exquisite was its temper that there was no sign of a notch or indentation of any description on its edge along its entire length, from point to hilt. I returned it to its sheath with much satisfaction, feeling that I had effected a most profitable exchange. End of chapter 14